Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. I need to quit preaching my message. Ephesians. Bishop, you're just something else. And uh, no, 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 you just listen just a minute. Here's a great man right here. Here's a great person. I'm the pastor here. You're, you're just right. the bishop. This is one terrific man right here. We're blessed. When a lot of father and son's pastorship doesn't work, if, you, if anybody ever asks you, say, how in the world did those people have gotten along for 17 years and never even had one disagreement? Tell them you just saw why, because he prefers me and I prefer him, and we care less who's doing the leading or who's getting the credit for it. And I want to tell you that. You don't have to worry about me getting offended if you go to him or him getting offended if you come to me. In fact, you go on to him. <laughs> I commission all you need counseling or anything. You, just, you won't hurt my feelings at all. You feel free. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 <laughs> and 14. <laughs> that we should be to the praises of his glory. Who first? Ephesians 1, 12 and 14. We're glad to have you home, Brother Lumpkin. It's a privilege to have you. He's been out taking care of our general conference in October in North Carolina. He is now a PR director for the headquarters and a whole bunch of other things for this movement, which we're blessed for. And he couldn't get in last night because of the weather. He made it home today, and we're very glad to have him back. Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. My subject tonight is, it's time for all of, all of us to move up a little higher. I did tonight. Now it's time for everybody to move up a little higher. Put your Bibles down. Let's just clap to the Lord a few minutes of praise to Him. You may be seated. I want you to turn real quick to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5. Would you do that? Hebrews 6 and 5, there's a short passage of scriptures that I want to bring to your attention that is, that is very important. Hebrews 6 and 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Who have tasted the good word of God. I think we've done that the last couple of weeks and the powers of the world to come. Because of the times, 1998 was really a historical gathering. When we had all those 50 nationals here, the regional superintendents, it was the first time that that has ever been done. And to think that Alexandria and the Pentecost of Alexandria was the place that it happened. You were the people that God used to host this sacred assembly. But it was only a foretaste of glory of the powers of the world to come. Paul said, when you received the Holy Ghost, it was only the earnest of your inheritance. It was only a token of what was to come. And what I'm telling you tonight is what happened here the Sunday night before because of the times when Brother Cole was with us and we had 55 people get the Holy Ghost. It is only a foretaste. It is only a sample of what God is getting ready to do in this place day in and day out. I want to tell you tonight that the ministry, the preaching at Because of the Times, is only a foretaste, just a little taste, just a little sample of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. It's time that this church, first of all individually, which will make it collectively, moves a little higher. We haven't seen anything yet. It's only a foretaste. 
It's only the earnest. It's only a token. It's only a down payment. It's only a preview. It's a little taste of what God is getting ready to do for us in this great church. As born-again New Testament believers, we have already tasted of the powers of the age to come. You got the first taste when you repented of your sins. You were water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you received the Holy Ghost and you spake in other tongues. It was as Fanny Crosby put it in her song, Blessed Assurance. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. It was just a foretaste of the glory that is to come. Not only in the future, but I believe right now. The receiving of the gift of the Holy Ghost gives an earnest, a pledge, a first installment of more to follow of the here and the hereafter. In prayer, more and more. In fellowship with one another, there's going to be more and more. In feeding upon the Word, there's going to be more and more. And in many ways, we sample in advance what we will be our regular fare throughout all of eternity. It's somewhat like a bookseller's some years ago. They would offer their customers a prospectus, which was the covers and the samples of the complete book. It was intended to awaken or to whet the appetite for the whole volume that was in the book. It was the crumbs that made you, as Brother Garb has talked about, to want the cake. God has offered us, even now, a prospectus of that which is to come. All of the pages are not there. Our hindsight is weak and our understanding is limited, but we can enjoy the prospectus. Before we get to read the heavenly, never-ending book, God says, I've given you the Holy Ghost. I've given you these things so that it can be just a small reading of what heaven is going to be like. We can have limited enjoyment of the age that is to come and reign in life before we reign with our Lord in eternity. I don't know how much of the age to come we may appropriate in advance, but I know this. Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after more, for they shall be filled. Never be satisfied. That's why I come back here tonight. I have thanked you for the things that you have done, but I've come back following the greatest meeting we've ever had, telling you we still got to be hungry for more and more and more and more. We can't rest because God gave us such a great conference. We can't rest because God's blessed us with 50 national missionaries. I'm hungry for more and more and more and more. Never have I been blessed in a conference like I was blessed. I think the preaching in this conference ministered to me greater than it has at any other time. But I'm still hungry for more and more and more and more. I'm like the little girl that was in the foster home that I told you about before. That in that foster home, they would have one glass of milk. Then they would have to take a sip and they would pass it to the next child. And she would take a sip and they would pass it to the next child. He would take a sip and they would pass it to the next child. When finally she was adopted and she went home with her adopted parents, she took a few swallows from that milk of, that they gave her the first time home. Then she looked up and asked, how much of this can I drink? And of course, the adopted parents told her, baby, you can chug a lug that just as fast as you can drink it. That whole glass of milk is yours. Many of us have only sipped and nibbled when we should and could eat and drink the whole glass. You are Gentiles that have been adopted by Almighty God. He don't want you just sipping a little blessing here and there. He don't want you just getting a little blessing at because of the times here and there. God wants you to turn up and drink the whole thing. He's given you everything. I wonder what would happen if we would drink the whole glass, claim the fulfillment of His promises for our body, our mind, and our spirit. I wonder what would happen if we would claim things for our family, for our church, for our city, for this nation. Even this age, before the age of the world that is to come, I wonder what would happen. I want to tell you, sweet people, the best sermon hasn't been preached. The best song hasn't been sung. The best service hasn't been had. 
the best revival hadn't hit the church yet, and I'm not going to sit around here sipping and nipping on something, but I know that God's got something much bigger than we've already received and we've already obtained even the last week. I am sure that we can have as much as we need to do what God wants us to do for as long as He wants us to do that. There is more for us here and now than a foretaste of glory. I'm going to tell you. Somebody said we're going to have to go to heaven for it to get any better than last week. No, you're not going to have to go to heaven for it to get any better than last week. It's going to get better than last week. I know that's hard to believe, but let me tell you why. Because the times are going to get worse. And you think that the devil's going to have a revival where it's going to get worse? That God's not going to have a revival where it's not going to get better? You think that God's already had his best day when the devil's still got to have his best day? Any day that the devil has, God's got a day to match it. No, the devil hadn't had his best day either. But the good news is, God hadn't had his best day yet either. The present provision, the foretaste, the sample, the prospectus is bound only by God's will, by our need, and by our faith. Within that blessed and glorious reign, there is as much as our faith will take and our vessels will hold. You can get that much. However much you need, whatever you think your vessel can hold, whatever you think your vessel can take, God said, I will feel it. We've had only a taste. We've had only a sip. Just a little preview, just a little prospectus of what God's going to do in this church. It's time to move up a little higher. I want our Bible study group leaders and our ministry team leaders to get the tapes and the videos. I want you to show them to your group. I want you to listen to them. I want you to watch them together. I want there to be prayer and fasting. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And say, there is a foretaste of what God wants for us. The best is yet to come if we will commit ourselves to move a little higher. When Jesus Christ was here on this earth, he demonstrated the powers of the age to come. In his miracles, we have samples. We have flashes of the day when we shall live free from all the limitations of this earth. He is not here now but he has called us out of this world. We are the ecclesia, the Bible calls, which is the called out ones, or which is the church, to live a supernatural life in this natural world. And there are special experiences which we may taste to an unusual degree of the powers of the age to come. There may be a touch of the body. There may be illumination of the mind. There may be a quickening of the Spirit in which we are granted a foretaste of glory, even above our average daily experiences. If you don't know it by now, let me tell all of you, three weeks ago, on that Thursday or Friday, when this man took a trip in the Spirit to heaven, that's an unusual experience. That's not reserved just for the bishop. That is reserved for all of us. God has experiences like that that is awaiting every one of us that's got loads on us. You're going to get strength in the next few days. I'm not up here with a positive mental attitude message. I'm up here with the Word of God to tell you. You're going to get strength in the next few days to deal with things in your family, sicknesses that you've been having to deal with, things you've been having to take care of. You're sitting here dead dog tired tonight. I have come to tell you, God's going to give you a supernatural invasion of the Spirit that God's going to quicken your mind. I want to tell you ministry team leaders that God is going to give you messages. I want to tell you young preachers that I am mentoring here, God's going to give you sermons like you have never seen. I want to tell those of you that's been bound by fear because of your past and things that's happened in your past, this is the year that God is going to baptize you with the supernatural touch, and you're going to be delivered from those things. There's more than just coming to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. God is going to do a foretaste for you on a daily basis where He's going to pour out His glory on you and His power is going. There's going to be a touch for your body, your mind, and your spirit. We are heirs. Would you say that with me? We are heirs to a better world. And we can begin to cash in on our inheritance. Everybody say, we can cash in on our inheritance. Shout now. You don't have to wait to get up there 
You can cash in on your inheritance now. You'll catch uh, my father now and then, or you'll catch Brother Lumpkin now and then. Want to take us out to do something, or our dad will want to buy something for me or Sister Mickey, or our Brother Lumpkin will want to do something for Mickey and Tanya and Jimmy. And he says, I don't want to wait till I die to give you things. I want to give them to you now so I can see you enjoy them. And you think my heaven, my earthly fathers want to do that for me? How much more does my heavenly father say, I don't want to wait till I get you up here to show you everything? I want to give you some things and watch you enjoy it down there. I want to see you get blessed down there. I want to see you take those things. I want to save all your inheritance till I die. I want to see you blessed with the things that I did ask. Now, I do not intend to live like a pauper. I intend to climb higher. I want you to know your pastor's committed to that. I'm not asking you to go nowhere I'm not going. If I ask you to go higher, I'm going there, and I don't mean four inches higher on a platform or two feet higher from the old platform. I'm talking about going higher in the Spirit. And before I ever ask you to go there, I'm going there. Before I ever ask you to fast, I fast. Before I ever ask you to pray, I pray. I'm not going to ask you to do nothing that I don't do. And I'm telling you, I'm not satisfied with where I am in the Lord. I'm not satisfied with just passing this great church or preaching good sermon. I'm going up in God, and I'm going to get a relationship with God that you're going to recognize. It started in October. This church began to come by pastors and says, there's something on you. There's a fresh anointing, the message you're preaching. You let me tell you, you notice that? You wait till the next wave hits me. It's going to be more evident to you than that wave. I plan on going up higher. I don't plan on staying on any plane. God's got more for me. I'm going to keep hunger. I'm going to keep being thirsty. I'm going to keep seeking after those things. Now for this church, this local church that has been so blessed, we've been so richly blessed, hosting, hearing, seeing, witnessing one of the greatest meetings of our day. Things that Brother Sism said, if you read the paper this past Saturday, what he said about you is just tremendous. I thank our foreign mission director for the kind things he said. But we can't stop at those things. It's time that we move up higher. There are three passages that, that I want us to read together from the book of Acts, which is Luke's description of the early church immediately following the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Everybody say immediately following the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> and if this church is to continue to be an example, a reference point, everybody say an example, a reference point, a pattern, that's why they came here. That's why this meeting is, is the largest gathering of preachers outside of our general conference. And it may have been more here than it was a general conference. The reason why is because there's been a pattern that they come here to see. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's not to see me, and it's not to see Dad and Mom, and it's not to see Sister Mickey. It's the pattern that has been set here. We must practice if we're going to continue to be a pattern in this organization around the world and even outside the organization, then we must practice the description of the early church in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, if you'll turn there, verses 46 through 47. For the next couple of weeks, folks, you really need to depend on your Bibles. We're going to try to have our monitors back working uh, when we get the stage built, uh, but we're, we're not going to set them up for every meeting because it's a lot of work to do that, and I'm sure you understand that. So I want you to be prepared to turn your Bible because I, I want you to be readers of the Word. Let's read Acts chapter 2, 46 through 47. Let's read together. You ready, everybody? Let's read. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from... They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 5.42. Let's read together. Acts 5.42. Everybody ready? Say amen. Let's read. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Acts 20 and 20. When you're there, say amen. Acts 20 and 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. In the first passage, Acts 2, 46. They continuing daily. Everybody say continuing. 
Continuing tells us that the early church comprised of a persistent people. Persistence is the quality of continuing in a task until it is completed. And they will not allow any obstacle to stop them until that task is completed. At the heart of persistence is the spirit of determination. And the key to determination is purpose. Paul described his own spirit of persistence and determination when he told the Corinthians, I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. We must keep the purpose in our minds and set goals for evangelizing the lost. We will need a spirit of persistence to do that. Everybody say persistent. That's what's got to be in this church. We've got to be persistent in what we do. We cannot slack up. We cannot slow down. We can't let obstacles stop us. We must be persistent. The second thing is, we must be a consistent. Everybody say consistent. First thing is persistent. The second is consistent people. Daily. Not just on Sunday morning. Not just on Sunday night. Not just on Wednesday night. The church in the book of Acts live their Christianity daily. They worship daily. They evangelize daily. They fellowship daily. They did nothing on a weekly basis. They did everything on a daily basis. And for a church to be a book of Acts church, they have to operate on daily basis, not on church services basis. Every day we wake up. I'm asking this church to commit individually. Every day you wake up, make it a day of worship. We have what we call 11 o'clock worship service on Sunday morning. We ought to have 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, whatever time you get up, you ought to say every morning of the week, I've got a 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock worship service schedule. And the first thing you do when your feet hit the floor and you roll out of that bed is you throw your hands up and say, I will praise you and worship you this day. I will give praise and honor and glory to your name. I will worship you on a daily basis. Day after day. Daily they were faithful in their pattern. Simply stated, they were a consistent people. Consistency is the quality of remaining constant. We must be a consistent, constant, daily people if we're going to lead in revival if we're going to be a leader of revival in this organization if other churches and preachers are going to look to alexandria we must be persistent and we must be consistent we can't be just sippers and nibblers we must not be satisfied with the crumbs we must eat the whole loaf and drink the whole glass we must get everything that god has for us persistent consistent The greatest thing that our bishop has is he is so consistent in his walk with God. That has been the virtue of this church because he led us in that and I have tried to follow in his footsteps. It is a consistent church. Persistent, you ought to have that written down. Second thing is consistent church. Third thing you need to write down is it was a united people. Look what it says with one accord. It's an expression that appears several times in the early verses of Acts. It speaks of a united people. The key to unity, of course, is a spirit of cooperation. We've always had unity in this church. Don't let anybody ever disrupt that unity. I would hate to be a part of anybody that disrupted the unity of this church. I would hate to be a part of any group or any person that was a talker in this church and tried to destroy the unity in this church. I don't know that it's been done, but I'd hate to be a part of anybody that tried to destroy that unity because when you can find unity, you're going to find strength. You're going to find revival. You're going to find growth. You're going to find progress. It's a spirit of cooperation. That's what else unity does. No matter how pure people may appear in proclaiming their doctrine, if they do not cooperate with others in strategies to win the lost and disciple them and build the church, they do not measure up to the unity of the early church. There is more to apostolic doctrine besides Acts 2.38 and dress codes. There is cooperation inside the body of Christ to where you hate, you help the unity of the church 
by cooperating in that church like you did a while ago. That's why this church is blessed. When pastor presents a need to you, you say, I'll cooperate. I want to be part of the unity. I'll bake a cake. I'll help do this. I'll help build a platform. I don't care if I'm under the lights or have a mic in my hand. I don't care who gets credit or who doesn't get credit. I don't care if I work in the nursery, clean the bathrooms, wherever you need me. I won't get my feelings hurt. I'll cooperate. We must unite in prayer, in doctrine, in breaking bread, in reaching, in teaching, in discipline. We must be united in our doctrinal beliefs. We got to be united in that. We got to be united in evangelizing the world and fulfilling the great purpose. It's time that we move up higher. Everybody say number three is unity. Now you've got them written down there. Mine are written separate, so I'm asking a minute, and I want somebody to be able to name them to me. Persistent, consistent, and unity. Number four, they were a loyal people. They met Acts 2, 46, daily in the temple. They came together corporately. They were committed to one another. They were loyal. They prayed together in the temple. They were loyal with each other. First of all, they were loyal to them with their mouths and their tongues and their attitudes. That's the first place you got to commit to one another is again, pastors on this, and I stay on it because that's what keeps us level. Loyalty is, I trust you, you trust me, we're in this together. We get enough attacks from with outside this place, we don't need to be attacking one another from inside this place. Be loyal to your other brother and sister. Be loyal to them. Stand by them. Let them know you'll help them anytime they need help. Let them know you'll support them anytime they need to be supported. If they're a member of this church, you let them know I'm loyal to you. I may not agree with everything you do or say, but I'm going to be loyal to you. And if I've got anything against you, the only one I'm going to tell is Jesus and pastor. But outside of that, I'm going to be loyal to you. When you've got that kind of unity and you've got that kind of loyalty, there is going to be a great revival that is going to be in this church and God is going to do a tremendous work in this place. Now, you just don't show loyalty by helping one another and you just don't show loyalty by keeping your tongues off each other. You also show loyalty by cooperating with each other. That's why I push prayer so much. That's why on the Saturday night before Because of the Times, we had 1,100 people here praying and, and it was a mighty move of God. And our general superintendent, he walked to the pulpit and he began to prophesy over this church. And he said, this church, God spoke to our superintendent and said, this church has not seen its best day. I'm getting ready to give you a revival like you have never seen. And that's why people received the Holy Ghost in prayer meeting. People were baptized in Jesus' name in prayer meeting. It's because there was loyalty. We came together. We supported one another. We prayed about each other's needs. Brother Urshan told to me, this is on video, this is on tape. I'm going to tell you what he told me. He didn't tell me I couldn't tell it, but this is what he told me. He called me again yesterday. He said, I, I want to tell you about that meeting. He leaned over to me on Wednesday night. He said, I can only remember two other meetings in the history of my life where I have felt the Holy Ghost moving as deep as the, is moving in because of the times. He said, and I don't know that those two can come up with this meeting. But I can remember two other times that I have felt the Holy Ghost moving as deep as it is moving in this congregation on these nights. That's only a foretaste. That's only a sample. That's only a token of what God will do when there are corporate prayer meetings, where we get together in united prayer meetings, where we get together on Saturday night, where you ministry teams get together in those homes and we have those prayer meetings. No matter if you're praying a three-hour shift, no matter if you're praying one hour a day here by yourself. You say, Pastor, that's a whole lot of praying. And let me tell you, we got them in this church that's doing that kind of praying. We've got people praying a three-hour prayer shift a week, and we've got people come by here and pray an hour a day. But let me tell you, that still won't suffice of you getting together with God's people and praying together. There's something about coming together with God's people. That's why when we get to ministering to one another, that's why on Sunday night in these prayer rooms upstairs, 
we get to lay in hands on each other. And the power of God begins to move. That's why I encourage you, though you can pray all over this church by yourself. You can get up in these halls, lady. I know some of you like to get by yourself. I'm not preaching against that because the Bible tells us to do that. But it also tells us there's a time when you need to get out of the halls. You need to get out of the room. You need to find the group of brothers and sisters. You need to get together with them. And in united corporate prayer, we need to pray together and ask God to give us a mighty revival. And when we do, God's going to bless us. That's why Saturday night, if you've got 10 minutes, if you've got 15 minutes, you ought to come by this church. You don't have to stay for the whole hour. You don't have to stay for everything. But I'd come by here and say, I just want to see what the body's doing tonight. I just want to see how they're praying tonight. I want to come by here and get in a unified prayer meeting. And you know what the Bible says where two or three agree on it would be done. You can't do that by yourself. He said it takes two or three agree. You get with two or three and start agreeing. You get united together. God's going to do a great thing. Which one am I on? Number five, giving people. Consistent, persistent people, consistent people, unity people, loyal people, giving people. Breaking bread, pictures of giving people. It pictures a loving spirit of generosity and hospitality. They gave of themselves as you have done. There is no way I can thank this church. There is no way I can thank you. There's no way I can thank you ladies' teams. And, and Sister Patsy, uh, Sister Barbara, you ladies that cook every time there's a funeral. There's no way I can thank you for that. But every time you cook in green beans and potatoes and you're so tired and worn out and don't even know the people that die nor the family in the church that die, you understand that God's keeping a record of that in heaven. He's going to help you pay your gas bill for that fire that's burning. He's going to help you pay for those green beans that you put in that pot. God's keeping a record of that in heaven. Look at those people down there in Alexandria. They're giving of their time. They're giving their finances. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to bless them. Giving people are blessed people. Giving people are blessed people. I thank God for this church. You've given yourself. You're a tired church tonight. And you're acting like you hadn't even come through a conference. You're acting better than most churches are acting tonight where they are. And I, I know we're all tired. You've worked hard. This choir and music worked hard. They were up late. Stayed here late. Work late. Our parking lot people work late. Brother Campbell and his crew, the usher crew, the hostesses, I mean, work these parking lots. Didn't even get to come into church. Work these parking lots. Worked in rain. Worked in sunshine. That's a given kind of people. And God said, if you'll be that kind of people, I'm going to do something for you. When you give, not just of your tithes and offerings, but when you give of yourself, by this will all men know that you're my disciple in that you will have love for one another. You will have a heart to give. You will have a heart to share. You won't want to, as Pastor said earlier, sit your carcass at home. You'll want to be part of a giving group of people. You'll want to say, what can I give, Pastor? I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about myself. I want to give myself. I want to get involved in the church. Everybody a minister. Everybody a minister. You know what my goal is here in the next year? Is to have everybody in this church involved in ministry. I don't care if you voted on Dad, if you voted on me, or if you just got here. My goal in the next year is to have everybody involved in some kind of ministry, a choir, a class, mission hotline, some kind of ministry you can point to and say, Brother, I'm going to be involved in the church of living God. I'm going to give myself to something. I may get tired and weary, but I'm going to give myself to something. I'm going to do something for God. Ministry. Everybody say giving. Giving myself. I'm not preaching on finances so much here, though that goes. But this is a giving church as far as finances. Uh, most of you pay your tithes. Those of you don't, you're not hurting us. You're hurting God. You're robbing God. And, and I doubt your salvation if you don't support the kingdom of God. But that's between you and God. And you've got to answer to God up there because you're not stealing from us because God blesses this church. You're stealing from Him. But, but this church is a giving group of people. And, and you're, you're a giving bunch of people. I'm not on finances right now. I'm on you. And you have been given yourself. There's no church that can work like you. I don't even know if this tape needs to go out. We may just need to put this one on hold. But there ain't no church like you. 
There's no 10 churches can keep up with you. You're the hardest bunch of working people I've ever seen. And that's why you're blessed. That's why your children are blessed. That's why this church is blessed. But I want to tell you, we haven't given yet what we can do and what God wants to do with us. There ain't much else in Alexandria Pentecostal can do. We got McDonald's, the Family Life Center, and church. So you might as well go ahead and give yourself to church and get involved in it. Let God use you. Live down here. Get you a tent and put it up. I want to be involved in giving myself. I want to be involved in the unity, the loyalty, the consistency, the persistency of the church. I want to be involved in it. That leads me to the next one. We must be a going people. Everybody say a going people. From spirit of giving will emerge a spirit of going. When the disciples broke bread, they did it from house to house. That reveals that they were caring, concerned people who involved themselves willingly beyond the confines of their own comfort zone. They went from house to house. We cannot wait for people to come to this church. We got to go to their houses. We got to get our charts under one arm and our Bibles under the other arm. We got to get our baked cakes. We need to read every tragedy we read in the paper. Somebody in this church ought to take it on themselves just to read a tragedy in the paper in about two weeks when, when all the flowers have faded and all the friends are gone. You ought to go by that house and say, I don't know who you are, but I'm from Pentecost of Alexandria. And I read about the tragedy you went through two weeks ago in the paper. And I want you to know that we prayed for you. And we want you to know any way our church can help you. You don't have to have a chart to do that. You don't have to have a Bible college degree to do that. You can just have a love for people. And some of you that don't know what your ministry is, that's a good place to start. You can start helping those that are in bereavement. You can help those that's going through things. You can help those that are hurting. That's a good place to start. But every one of us can see something that we can do from house to house. They were a going people. We can't wait for them to come to us. We got to go to them. It's time to move a little higher. Am I making you tired tonight? Pastor, you're just wearing us out. I'm telling you, that's what made this church great. 30, 40 years ago, we'd get tired. Here'd come GA Investor. They'd kick us on the backside of that. Get up. We're not there yet. They'd take it and drive us. That's what's made this a great church. Anybody can have an accomplishment to sit down and go to sleep. But a great church says we ain't not seen our best service yet. We haven't had our best Messiah yet. We haven't had our best because of times yet. Seventh thing. They were a happy people. The book of Acts church did not only break bread from house to house, but they did it, verse 46, Acts 2, with gladness of heart. Gladness of heart pictures a joyous, happy, radiant people. The joy of the Lord is essential to a growing, powerful, vibrant church. Joy produces healthy, radiant, producing believers. If you've lost your joy, find it. Need to get your joy back. If I've hurt your feeling, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Did that help you get your joy back? Whatever's done, get your joy back. Don't let your boss steal it. Don't let your job steal it. Don't let your companion steal it. Don't let your children steal it. Don't let your finances steal it. Don't let nothing steal your joy. We sang a song at 16th and Day Street. This one is real, real old. We are happy people, yes we are. We are happy people, yes we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name, spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. We are happy people, yes we are. You like that one? How many's done that? Why aren't you happy? Where's your smile? Where's your joy? Is your Sunday school class become a drudgery? Go pray through. Are you dreading coming to church on Wednesday night? Go pray through. Do you dread doing your ministry around here? Go pray through. You're not going to be of effect till you get your joy back. 
We are happy people, yes we are. We are happy people, yes. Been baptized, been baptized in Jesus' name, spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. We are happy people, yes we are. We are happy people, yes we are. We are happy people, yes we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name, spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. We are happy people, yes we are. Happy, happy, joy, 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 joy. Happy, 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 happy. You may be seated. You know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to the fun shop tomorrow in the mall, and I'm going to buy one of those laughing machines. Brother Lumpkin had a, has a nephew that, that sings that song, I've been tickled by a feather and I've been tickled by a bee. And when that guy goes, ah, I'm going to walk up behind some of you that's got this prune look on your face, and I'm going to go, ah, and you're going to probably turn around and be very disrespectful to your pastor. But some of you, I will turn the other cheek if you do. But some of you need to find your joy again. You haven't been happy in a while. And it's not supposed to be work serving God. It's not supposed to be boredom serving God. To come to church on Wednesday night, that's not something you have to do. That's something you ought to say, I can't wait to get to church. Pastor will feed my soul if I can just get to church. Just happy. We've got to get our smiles back, people. We've got to get our smiles. That's what's made this church a revival church. That's what made it a book of Acts church. When they come in here and see all of us, hey, brother, hey, it's good to see you. Man, I, instead of coming in. Not going to get it. They can get that at other churches. They, they want to see joy. This world's about to kill them. They're hiding behind their mask. They're looking for something that's real. And when they come in here, I want them to feel something. They will, whether you're smiling or not, because we're going to pray it down. But I'm going to tell you what. What will move them next to the Holy Ghost is when they see a smiling, happy group of people rejoice. There's time we come here with burdens. There's time we come here and there's not a smile on our face. And pastor preaches a burden message and we go to our face and we seek God. There's... There's those nights that come along. But as a whole, this has to be a happy church. And it's always been a happy church. And don't get here in the 90s and let all of us are being hit. My entire day, with the exception of a couple hours of prayer, has been spent in counseling. Serious cases, people hurting, people making bad choices, marital problems. But I can't let that get me down. I hurt for those people. And one problem with your pastor that my father does not have his dad can go home. He loves you more than I love you. But he's, he's got a different... I got some of my mother in me and I shouldn't have. But, but you, see, you, see, you see this right here? This half right over here could walk out tonight and say, we're going across town starting a church. Dad say, so long. Y'all have a good time. Be careful, you him. I would worry about it the rest of my life. Dad, he'd go home sleeping like a baby. 
I carry things home, and if I don't watch it, the problems you're going through affects me because of my personality makeup and my love for you. So I have to say, mm -mm, not you nor your problems going to steal my joy nor my happiness. I hate you going through that. I'm going to counsel with you and I'm going to pray with you and we're going to get you through that. But while I'm getting you through it, I'm going to be smiling and rejoicing and we're going to be praising God and we're going to be rejoicing together. <laughs> Sister Danzy won't mind me saying this, but I walked in the foreign missions one day. She said, Pastor, are you okay? I said, Sister Danzy, I'm fine. She said, well, you just didn't look like... I said, I'm carrying my Tuesday night because of the Times message. She said, thank you. That explains it. But she just wanted to make sure everything's okay with Pastor. Because when you see me, that's usually the way I'm going to be. Hey, y'all, how you doing? I made, all the world may have just caved in on me. But to help people, my brothers and sisters, and the center people that look towards me, I got to keep my happiness. That's a book of Acts Church. You got to keep your happiness. Don't let, don't let nothing get to you. Thank you, Brother Lumpkin. That's, that's the truth. That's where you get the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's where you get it. I know I went to Branson one time when I was a sinner. <laughs> that's, not, <laughs> that's not the truth. We go there about every year. But <clears throat> Dad, Dad, Dad loves Shepherd Hills. And, and, and you remember that, that couple that's coming in, that lady? How many has ever seen Shepherd Hills? You raise your hand. Well, the rest of you are backslid if you haven't seen Shepherd Hills. You know, that couple's coming in, and I mean, she's just crying. Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you carried out the garbage? Why haven't you, you just, hey, y'all, how y'all doing? It's good to see you. Remember that one? Yeah. So it don't matter what's happened at home. When you get here, or when you get outside that house, you, my brother Lumpkin's preaching, mother's preaching, daddy's preaching. It's on all of us now. <laughs> Gladness of heart. She wants me to say that one. His with joy of the Lord is my strength. Anybody else got any? That's joy. That's happiness. Come on. Keep them coming. I'll, I'll let everybody help me preach. What? Stand up and shout it. That's very good life. A good life. Anybody? And joy in the Holy Ghost. Anybody else got anything to say? With joy shall you draw water out of the well of salvation. Draw it, pump it, turn it on, something. There you go. Get your joy. Bring a sinner to church. Thank you. Okay, number eight. Was that where we were? That was a good one. I might need to stop there, finish this. No, I need to go 10 more minutes. You people may have a nervous breakdown if you got out early. <laughs> uh, Shirley. She was just getting ready to open her mouth to somebody, and I caught her. <laughs> it was a steadfast people. Everybody say a steadfast people. Not only were they a happy people, carrying out their ministries with gladness, but there was singleness of heart. They were steadfast people, firm in their convictions. A made-up mind knew what they believed, and they were steadfast in their convictions. Folks, you got to love Acts 2.38. you got to love one God. you got to love holiness and separation from the world our church standards, and our biblical standards. You've got to get steadfast in it. Don't be messing with it. To stay apostolic, this is what the man... To stay apostolic, that's what it's got to be. There can be a church that can run 5,000 and remain apostolic all the way around. Be steadfast, unmovable. Don't let anybody shake you. It don't matter who else in the church does something. It don't matter what somebody else's kids does or what some other family does. Say, that's for them. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So you, you can't be people that's moving from with every wind of doctrine. 
You can't be church and everything, chasing this and chasing that. You got to have a doctrine you made up in, your mind made up. You got to be on a firm foundation. As, 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 as the bishop preached this Thursday night, you can't look to the right, you can't look to the left, you can't let nobody affect you, you can't let nobody influence you. Be steadfast, unmovable, solid on the rock, Christ Jesus. You're waiting for this church to move, you're waiting for the wrong church because we're not moving off of our doctrinal beliefs. That's how we got to where we are. People are wanting something right now. They're not wanting just everything to mingle. And, and as Brother Mooney preached, just whatever. They don't want just a whatever. Everybody just do what you want to do. We'll, we'll all get there. They want some definites. They want some things. Like, and you watch. The closer we get to come to the Lord, that's what's going to separate the church from the churches is those that's got some definite things. Even if I don't agree with them, they, there's some, uh, the, the, the Mormons are one of your fastest growing groups right now. You know why? They have some definites. I don't agree with them damnable things, but they have some definites. And people's going to want some kind of definites in their life. And that's what's going to build their families. That's what's going to build their children's life. What's going to stab you. Be steadfast, unmovable. Number nine. We're halfway there. I'm not going to preach them all tonight. They were appraising people. Woo! Constantly praising God. It was in the spirit of praise that the church was born. And they were continuing in the temple. Luke, praising and blessing God continually, consistent, persistent, in the temple, praising and blessing God. This is going to be a praising church. If praising upsets you, you're in the wrong church. And you can find you a good one where they won't get on your nerves. You can find you some good Pentecostal churches where you can hear a pin drop and it sounds like atomic explosion. But if you're going to come to this church, let me warn you right now, it's going to be a praising church. If it gets dead, I'll get me a tambourine and start having victory marches like my dad used to do in the old church or under the tent when we were out here on MacArthur Drive. We're going to be a praising church. We're going to clap our hands. We're going to shout with loud voices. We're going to dance in these aisles. The federal judge and his wife that we baptized three Sunday nights ago, I didn't know if she had ever come back to church. We got on one of those choir songs, and it's got to romping and stomping, and we danced all over her, and there were people in front of her waving, may have even hit her upside. I don't know what all was going on over here. They were having a revival praising God. I said, that lady will never, never come back. And folks, not only that, they got a Bible study. We baptize them both in Jesus' name. They got the Holy Ghost in the water three Sunday nights ago. Our federal judge here that's, that's over the uh, Social Security Department of the federal department here in our city is now baptizing Jesus' name full of the Holy Ghost. And you know what got her? It was what you think wouldn't have got her. It was an apostolic service where there was no preaching, where the choir came pouring out down here. You choir members, don't you put your seat belts on up there. If you feel led to hit these aisles, you hit these aisles. You come out of that choir dancing and praising and magnifying God. This is a praising church. This is a worshiping church. This is a glorifying church. I think the qualification to sit in the balcony ought to be, you ought to have to run that aisle at least once every month. That's a good place to get up there and hide, folks. Don't you get up there and hide. That's a good place to hide. You need to take that balcony and say, I may be in the balcony. I can't get a seat on the bottom floor, but I'm going to praise the Lord in the balcony. Those of you on the risers, I know that's steep over there. I know those stairs are steep. You get off of them stairs, get down there on the flat floor, and get to praising God. We got Everybody's got to praise the Lord. Everybody's got to praise the Lord. Everybody doesn't have to dance, but everybody's got to praise the Lord. That's good preaching. You know why? That gets people. There's nothing like it. It's more than an act. It's a lifestyle with me. Praising gets hold of me. I, I can put on a, a tape or I can put a CD in my car and get to listen to gospel music or get to hearing a good sermon. And, and man, when I get going, I, I, I just get to praising God. I can be driving around this town and put in me a CD. And I can put in, i tell you a good one to put in. Put in Johnny James. That won't light your fire. Your fire can't get lit. How many's heard that tape yet? How many hadn't heard that tape yet? Would you raise your hand? Let me, ooh, most of you. That was during the day. Just let me tell you this. You want to you wanna see it on the video. You go over there and get it. i tell you what let's do. Ministry teams, you need to show that tape to your teams. 
He'll light your fire. He gets to magnifying Jesus. Man. He gets to calling him all the names that he is. His IQ is about 200. I mean, it, it, they don't even have one goes that high, I don't think. But you'll get to praising God. Praise him in the car. Praise him in your home. Praise him where you're mowing the yard. Praise him when you're shoveling the snow. Praise him. I'm dreaming of a February Christmas. Just praise him for what I'm trying to get across. I knew that would get your attention. Praise him. Praise him. There's no time you shouldn't have a, a praise for God. I'm going to give you 10 and 11. No, I won't. I'll give them to you, but I won't preach on them. Number 10 is they were a humble people. Out of this spirit of deep reverence for God and submission to Him, we see a truly humble people. Therefore, they were continually having favor with all people. They impacted their community because they were a humble, serving, loving, hospitable people. Sister Mickey's here by now, I'm sure. But she, the governor's wife, called and asked her to help with a certain situation. Mrs. Foster. And Mickey is working with that situation tonight. A servant for the community. You've got to have a humble servant attitude. And when you do, God will bless you. Humble thyself and the Lord will draw near you. What's that mother used to sing? Humble thyself and His presence will cheer thee. God will not walk with the proud of the scornful. Humble thyself to walk with God. Instead of anybody saying, man, at our church, we just had the greatest con Man, at our church, they all say, uh-uh, God, we're not even worthy enough for you to have allowed that meeting to come to our church. We don't know why you chose little old Alexandria that started 48 years ago at 16th and Day Street with a handful of people, and they kept themselves humble and followed this great leader. He followed Christ, and they had unity this whole trip, and now God's brought. We don't know God. But when we get here with all of this, and we have this beautiful stage, and everybody that knows anything about dramas will be talking about Messiah in the next few weeks, and it's the greatest thing. There's nothing on Broadway like And you'll hear all these things, and you'll hear it's better than anything Broadway. It's the best production I've ever seen. Instead of you doing like this, let it do you like, thank you, God. We give you praise. We humble ourselves before you, God, that you took a bunch of New Testament Israelites, a bunch of holy, roly Pentecostals, and you've grabbed the attention of not just Louisiana, but states around us through a drama called Messiah. We're very humbled by that God that you took your people and blessed us. And I close with this. They were a trained people. They were a trained people. We got ministry training going, and you're going to find it through our ministry team leaders even stronger. We're going to start training, 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 training. Did you see that silver mine set up over there? How many went over there tonight? Did you raise your hand? Folks, if you did, if your kids are nowhere near civil man age, I beg everybody in this church, I beg you to go look. If you think our Family Life Center is nice, this rivals our Family Life Center. Yes, we spend a lot of money there, but I'm going to tell you what, that's the kids. As one man said, how many got saved? He said one and a half. Adult, one child. He said one and a half. He said, yes, the adult's the half, and the child was one. He said, because the adult, his life was just about over, but the child had his whole life to live. We got brand new tables. Please, if you can get over there after church. If you can't, go over there Sunday morning before 11 o'clock. That's when they start. You're going to see one of the great... It's a little church up there. They got their own auditorium. They got their class. They got the most beautiful paintings on the wall that I've ever seen. It, we've come a long ways from Sister Carrie and Sister Rolaine and some of these other people. We've come a long ways in the last 48 years. But you go over there and look. Training. I said, what do you, when I went through it tonight in open house, I said, what are you going to do? He said, we're going to train them how to win souls. We're going to train them how to pray. We're going to train them how to fast. We're going to train them how to teach Bible studies. We're going to train them, 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 train them. 
we're coming to you from our ministry team leader. Process 2000. Try to attend it, everybody. Leadership training, not process to leadership training the first hour. I'm going to be training, 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 training. They were a well-trained church. And when we do, we're going to reach the world. Amen? Aren't you glad you're part of a great church? Let's stand and praise God. Can we do that? We give you praise, God. Give you glory and honor. I want all the men to come up here with me real quick. Would you do that? I think we can all get on this platform. Come on quickly, men. All the men up here on the platform with me. Y'all just sort of get behind me back there. We're going to meet together next Wednesday night and have a good time together. Such great men. Don't they look nice, ladies? Come on down. We'll, we'll get you up here. Boy, oh, look at this. Look at this. I need some of you men to meet me here at the steps and, and uh, get Billy up the steps for me, please. I want him up here with us. Terry here. Oh, there's a ramp around the back. If you want to roll him out, roll him up that ramp. I need some men to help there. Come on, gentlemen. Love you, fellas. Come up here, gentlemen. Come on, Brother Mabry. Hey, buddy. Isn't this a good-looking crew? <laughs> Ladies, I'd like you to step out in the aisle together. Would you do that? Just sort of move this way in the aisles. That's it. Just, just do that. Dad, do you ever think you'd see that many men? Dad, did you ever think you'd see that many men in this church? That's a good church right there. Men, I want you to look at these ladies out here. First of all, that's our church family. Second of all, that's our wives and our daughters and some of the greatest Christians there is. Let's give our ladies a hand. Can we do that? We love you, ladies. We give you honor. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bearing our children. Thank you for your love and kind to all of us. Now, what I want to do before we leave is I want us to get to as many people as we can tonight, lady to lady. Come on, buddy. Get up here with Pastor. You better believe it. Get up here with me. I want us to get to as many as we can get, lady to lady. Now, I just don't want you to hug two or three necks and get out the back door. I want you to hug as many necks as you can hug. And I want you to tell them we've got a great church. I love you. I'm praying for you. I may not even know your name, but if you're a member of this church, I'm praying for you. We're going to let unity abound in this church. Any way I can ever help you, I want to help you. I want a little love to be shared here tonight. Can we do that? Then the men are going to hug one another's neck. Now, you know, men, I tell you this every time. That one scripture in the Bible, I, we don't fulfill. We don't believe in greeting our brother with a holy kiss. You keep your kisses to yourself. You go kiss your wife when you get home. You don't be kissing on me. Well, we may all lose our joy over that, I tell you that. But I, we're going to go home when you feel like you've hugged enough necks. You go ahead and leave. But how, you want to repent of your sins? We want to pray with you. You want the Holy Ghost? We want to pray with you. God bless you. Fellowship, don't be in a hurry. It's 25 to 9. Stay there for 10 minutes at least.